Hello, this is CJ Hoyle. Today is Sunday, August the 29th, 2021, and I'm here at the Upper Brewer's Lock Station on the Rideau Canal, and welcome to day two of my solo canoeing adventure on the Rideau Canal. So the time is currently about 6.20 a.m., and I'm just working on getting everything packed up and ready to leave for the day. You can see that my tent still needs to come down over there, and there's also a bunch of other tents that are located over here from other paddlers who were doing the same thing camping here last night. One of those tents belongs to a couple who are here with a canoe, and the other three tents belong to those three kayakers who I shared the lower brewer's lock with yesterday. I had a chance to speak with them, and they're planning on doing pretty much the same trip as me. They started from Kingston yesterday, and they're planning on going as far as Ottawa, but they are planning on doing a little bit faster than me, so there's a good chance that after today I probably won't see them again. So the tent is now taken down, now time to move the canoe over there, load it up, and begin paddling over that way through that nice still water. Starting from here at the Upper Brewer's Lock Station, my plan for today is to continue following along the route of the Rideau Canal with the goal of making it as far as the Chafee's Lock Station where I can camp tonight. So the time is now just before 7 a.m. and as you can see I'm now out in the water with the canoe fully loaded and ready to begin paddling that way. Things are so nice and beautiful and calm and peaceful this morning. Just a short distance upstream from the lock station, there is a dam here, which also includes a hydroelectric generating station, I believe. And lots of cottages built along this channel here. Some of them built atop the rocky cliffs. So I've now reached the portion of the waterway where it opens up into a lake, which is called Cranberry Lake. And I was reading on an information panel last night at the lock station that prior to the construction of this waterway, Cranberry Lake was nothing more than a swamp. It also said that this swamp contained some kind of a disease and the workers who were exposed to it developed a fever and several of them died. I've really been enjoying the scenery this morning. A lot of this lake seems to be largely undeveloped, but the parts of the shoreline that are developed have cottages that seem to be really old. And I've also got this whole place to myself so far this morning. No other paddlers and I haven't seen any motorboats yet this morning either. Over there there's a loon. The bird which appears on the one dollar coin here in Canada. Up ahead I can see a boat there with some people fishing inside it, which is the first other boat that I've seen on the water so far today. And over here on the right I notice this cornfield, which is right beside the lake. Over here I believe I see a family of loons. It's quite uncommon to see that many of them all together at once. Usually it's just one or two, or more commonly just one. So the time is now just after 8 o'clock and I've paddled about 5.3 kilometers and I'm just going to take a break here just beyond this island to have some breakfast. And back behind me there you can see those three kayakers who were camped at the lock station last night who have now passed me as they continue their way down the waterway. So as you can see those overnight oats that I prepared last night have now blossomed into a delicious bowl of oatmeal that I'll be able to enjoy to energize myself for my day of paddling and I'll also have some orange juice to go with it. So feeling all fueled up, I'm now back on the water continuing my way and you can see that the wind has picked up a little bit and it seems like the wind is coming from behind me today, which should be nice. There's my first great blue heron of the morning. I saw dozens of them yesterday. Up ahead there's a bridge for a road called Burnt Hills Road. As you can see it's quite a low bridge, but it does have this one section here which can be swung out of the way. It doesn't look like they're open yet, but I should be able to squeeze the canoe underneath there without too much trouble. You can see a lot of this bridge is made out of wood, just like it was I'm sure originally. Over here docked next to the bridge you can see this boat, which is the scow number two for the Rideau Canal. So beyond the bridge things narrow down a little bit here. And this water body here is known as Little Cranberry Lake. So far it seems to be pretty grey and cloudy this morning, much like it was yesterday. The temperature is apparently 22 degrees Celsius, but it feels warmer than that, so I'm not particularly minding being shaded by those clouds. As per this sign up ahead, I'm now entering an area known as Sealy Bay. So down this arm of the bay over here is the community of Sealy Bay, which apparently has a grocery store. So my plan is I'm going to paddle over that way so I can make a stop there and hopefully stock up on a few things. So straight ahead here is the community of Sealy Bay and I believe that's a public boat launch up ahead where I should be able to leave the canoe while I wander around the community. Over that way I can see a lot of silos. We're definitely in farmland again. 
Day use only. Yep, that should work for me. So the canoe's docked up over there. Now I'll wander over this way and go and check out Seely's Bay. You can see some people here with inflatable paddle boards just getting ready to set off. So it seems like a relatively quiet community. And you can see there's a restaurant over there and over this way there's a hardware store as well as another restaurant and a few other things. Here you can see the Seely's Bay Post Office along with a number of houses that are built along here. This is really the type of small town that I love to visit. And here's the community's fire hall, and you can see that Seely's Bay is part of the township of Leeds and the Thousand Islands. Over here is the St. Peter's Anglican Church, circa 1890, and around this way is the Sweets Fresh Mart grocery store, which is where I'm gonna stop in and grab a few things. All right, so I've got my groceries now. Now I'm gonna walk my way back to where I parked the canoe. I just love walking around old communities like this. They have so much character. So I'm now back at the boat launch where the canoe is waiting for me patiently over there. So during that excursion, I bought a Grand Gym sandwich, which I'll hopefully be enjoying as my lunch today. I bought a cob of corn, which I assume was probably farmed very close to here, a cucumber, a couple of ripe bananas, it's pretty rare to see ripe bananas available in the store these days, so I couldn't help myself from stopping and buying a few, and also some store-baked donuts. All right, now I'm back in the water and ready to paddle my way back out of this bay and rejoin the Rideau Canal route. So over that way is where I came from this morning, and where those boats are coming from over there, that's where I'm heading. The next lock station that I'm heading towards is called Jones Falls. And here you can see those paddle borders that I saw earlier. So the time is now 10.50 and I paddled 14 kilometers so far. So just through these narrows up ahead, the waterway opens up into a lake called Whitefish Lake. And it appears we've paddled away from the farmland again, as you can see all these big rocky cliffs telling us that we're within the Canadian Shield. So here's a look at Whitefish Lake. I want to be heading over that way, so I'll be hugging the western shore of the lake. Just being passed by this big boat here. Pretty sure the flamingo is not the one who's actually driving. As you can see, I've still got the wind pushing me from behind, which is a nice feature. Here's a bunch of boats coming in the other direction. I wouldn't be surprised if they're all bunched together because they came through on the same lock ahead at Jones Falls. So I'm further along Whitefish Lake now and things start to narrow over this way. The channel is straight ahead there and there's an island to the right called Hog Island, which I'll be passing along beside. So here I've now reached those narrows and after I go through here I think that the help from the wind will probably be less because after I get through Jones Falls I'll be curving and heading kind of more in the west direction. I'm really enjoying this scenery along here. I know it doesn't look great on camera because of the gray sky but believe me it's really nice being out here. So up ahead I can see some of the community of Jones Falls and the lock station should just be right up there around the corner to the left. So up ahead there on the left you can see lock 42, which they've got the gate open for, so I guess I'll paddle on right inside. Alright, so here I've paddled inside the lock and I'm sharing the lock with this other vessel over here. And because I'm parked on this side of the lock, I actually decided to pull the canoe in backwards, or in other words I flipped the canoe around, and that's because I have my 2 liter pop bottle bumpers only on this side here, so it works a little bit better to flip the canoe around. There you can see that they're closing the gates there back behind me. So Jones Falls is a total of four locks and they're arranged very similar to the Kingston Mills locks that I went through yesterday. The first three locks are all the flight of locks. They're all sort of back to back, one after the other. So number 42, number 41, and number 40 are all together. Then there's a turning basin followed by lock number 39. So I'm gonna take my time inside the lock here to have my lunch, starting off with a cob of corn. Believe it or not, corn on the cob tastes just as good when it's raw. So they've raised the water up in this lock so high that it's actually overflowing the gate a little bit over there. And here they're opening up the gates to lock number 41 where I can proceed. And as they close those lock gates, the next thing on the menu is my sandwich, which I bought in Seely's Bay. As lock 41 continues to fill up, I'm enjoying one of these bananas. So now we've reached the top of lock number 41, and behind me they're opening up those gates, which will allow me to paddle into lock 40. So as they close the gates of lock number 40, I'm going to try one of these donuts. So this is not my first time at Jones Falls. 
Two years ago, I did a bike tour of Eastern Ontario, and I came and visited here, and I actually even spent the night camping at this log station. So we're now up at the top of Log 40, and they've opened up the gates, and I'm gonna let this boat go ahead of me. And over here to the right is where I had my tent pitched the last time that I was here in Jones Falls. So this water body here that's in between the two locks is called a turning basin and that's because the next lock is oriented about 90 degrees off from the one that I just came through. So I'm just approaching lock number 39 and over here to the left there is a old stone building. So here you can see they're closing up the gates of lock number 39. Jones Falls has a lot of really nice scenery, including a massive historic stone arch dam that was built when this lock station was first opened. Since I was just here two years ago though, I'm deciding to stay in the canoe and not get out this time. But if you do want to see a little bit more around Jones Falls, I definitely recommend going back and watching that video that I filmed two years ago here. Something that I remember learning the last time that I was here in Jones Falls are that the locks that are built here are among the highest locks on the canal. All right, so here they open up the gates and I'll proceed my way out of lock number 39. And up here at the top of the lock, sort of where that grassy area is, that's where the top of that stone arch dam is. So kind of underneath this water, that stone goes very deep down and it has obviously caused the water levels to go up quite a bit from what it used to be, which would have just simply been a river running through a rocky gorge. So the route of the waterway continues over this direction and I'll be paddling underneath of that bridge. This bridge is for a road called Jones Falls Road. So I mentioned that trip where I came here in September of 2019 and I camped at Jones Falls, but I also came here on another bike trip back in May of that same year, and I didn't quite make it to Jones Falls, but I did ride my bike across this bridge here. There's another great blue heron over here. They're very abundant around these parts, so I'm not even sure whether it's worth pointing them all out now. There's quite a zigzaggy path through these narrows here. So as I make my way out of these narrows, that lake up ahead that I'm heading towards is called Sand Lake. So as the sky begins to turn blue, I'm working my way through Sand Lake. That land that's straight ahead there is an island called Birch Island. And I believe it would be possible, possibly for me to be able to paddle over that way to get to where I'm going. But the route of the canal signs it to go this way, so I think that's what I'm going to follow just to be safe. It's also an opportunity for me to see more of Sand Lake than just what I can see here in this small bay of it. Over on my right here, I'm paddling past the Sand Lake Marine. And passing me in the other direction is a houseboat. Looks like a rental boat, big Rideau Lake boat rentals. And I'm just gonna be paddling up around that way, working my way around Birch Island to the left. So I've ran at the point of Birch Island and here you can see more of Sand Lake as it opens up into a relatively large lake over that way. So the time is now about 1.35 and I paddled 23 kilometers so far and before I go any further I'm just taking a little break here in the shade from some of these trees on Birch Island because the sun is definitely out now and beating down pretty hard. So I'm now paddling my way in the west direction and the wind seems to have reoriented itself so I'm now paddling against it instead of having it behind me when I was coming north. So I'm just passing another island here called Fahey Island and over towards this end of Sand Lake things narrow down as the waterway makes its way over towards the Davis Lock. So here's a closer look down into these narrows and I believe Davis Lock, lock number 38, is just around that corner down there. All right, so here's lock number 38, Davis. They've already got one of the gates open so I'll make my way inside. All right, so you can see that they've closed up that lock gate behind me and they'll be raising the water level in here up to that upper level up that way. And since the sun seems to have come out this afternoon, I'm gonna take this opportunity to put on a little bit of extra sunscreen because it seems pretty intense. When you're going up in a log, the log staff always recommend that if you're in a canoe or some type of paddle craft, it's a good idea to position yourself towards the back of the log. And that's because when they let the water in, there's quite a bit of turbulence inside the log. So this is, even though I'm bobbing up and down a fair bit here, it would be even worse if I was up that way. All right, here I am up to the top of the lock and they're opening up the gates for me to paddle my way out. So here I'm paddling my way away from Davis Lock and this water body up ahead is called Opinicon Lake. So far Opinicon seems to be a lake of many islands. So the time is now about 3 p.m. and I paddled almost 27 kilometers 
And looking over that way to the left, you can see more of Opinacon Lake. And if you look up to the sky, you can see that some dark clouds are starting to form. I did get an alert earlier for a severe thunderstorm that might be in this area, but hopefully it won't come before I reach the next lock station. There's a boathouse which has seen better days. The black clouds over that way, and as you can see, the wind is coming from that direction, so I have a bad feeling that I am gonna get rained on. So I believe that blue line on that dock is for the lock station up ahead, and things are still staying dry so far, and I haven't yet heard any claps of thunder either. Okay, so what I thought was the lock station is actually just a private business. The lock station is actually over that way. I was confused by the blue on this dock here, which is something that you always see at lock stations, because it's the area where the boats are supposed to wait when they're waiting to go inside the lock. I guess they also use it for gas docks too. Up around this corner here is the actual entrance into the lock station. See, there's the actual blue line, and there's the lock station. So this is lock number 37 Chafee's, and there doesn't seem to be any lock staff outside right now, so I guess I'll tie up the canoe and go and let them know that I'm here and want to go through the lock. So I just spoke with one of the lock staff, and they're going to be right down to let me out through the lock. And unfortunately, it just started raining now, so I'm going to do my best to make sure everything is well waterproof because I have a feeling I'm going to get rained on now. So they're just letting the water out of the lock now because it was in the upper position when I arrived, and it seems like the rain may have stopped. So here they open up the gates and they're letting another boat out of there, and I'm hoping that I should be able to get a spot in the lock that'll be underneath of that bridge and sheltered from the rain because it has sort of picked up again. All right, so here I am inside the lock, and just like I had hoped, I'm gonna be sheltered by this bridge. Now it's really not raining that hard, and I do have pretty much everything waterproof really well, but it is sort of a shame to have everything wet on the outside when you're about to put it inside of a tent. It's nice that they give the lock staff umbrellas to stand underneath of when it's raining, and I guess also probably when it's really sunny too. So as the lock fills up with rainwater, we're just about up at the top, and I'll make my way out into that rainy wonderland. So as I mentioned earlier, Chafee says the lock where I'm gonna be camping tonight, so I've docked the canoe here, and transferred my stuff to a dry spot right up there. They've got these docks stored here, which as I mentioned, that's a place where I've been putting my stuff here to keep it dry. Um, all my important stuff that actually needs to be dry is inside waterproof bags like this, but you know, like I said, it's kind of annoying if the outside of them is wet when you have to put them inside of a dry tent. Here's a look at the log station up from the top, and on the top side, there are quite a few other people camping here tonight. There's a big pile of canoes down there and this is the log station building where I'm hoping to purchase my camping permit for tonight. So I purchased my camping permit and there you can see a bunch of the other people who are camped here with their canoes stored over here and my plan is to camp in between these two stacks of stored docks. Well it is still raining but the sun has come out which gives me hope that things should dry out pretty soon. I figure I might as well just wait until it stops before I set up my tent because setting up a tent while it's raining is kind of annoying. So the rain has now stopped and the sun is shining brightly and my tent is set up over here now. And I was also given a sandwich by one of my neighbors. So that sandwich came from a nearby restaurant which is called the Opinicon. And as far as I know, it's the only restaurant that's around in this area. And it's actually where that blue dock that I saw earlier was. Uh, that's actually that restaurant. And I had you know, read a little bit about this restaurant ahead of time and I thought maybe I'd be able to go there for dinner tonight, but I'd also seen that they had some unusual rules uh, due to the pandemic. They were sort of operating in an unusual way. So I wasn't necessarily, you know, counting on it. I have all kinds of, you know, packaged foods that I can eat instead. Uh, but anyways, after I arrived here, I was talking to one of those other canoeists and I was sort of, you know, saying, oh, I might go over there for dinner. And he said, oh, actually, they've already closed and you missed your chance to place your order. And I said, oh, okay, you know, not a big deal. Anyways, he did place his order ahead of time and he ordered too much food so he brought over the other half of his sandwich for me which was very nice of him so i'm looking forward to that there's a sign on that boathouse which says no wake area frequented by mermaids but i'm pretty sure that's not what a mermaid looks like so i'm just out for a short walk before i have my dinner and there you can see that opinicon restaurant which right now is only offering takeout orders just up the road there's a store called brown's marina general store but they closed about 20 minutes ago. It would have been nice to maybe go there for ice cream after my dinner, but that's okay. It seems like a lot of the businesses in these small communities that rely on tourism seem to really shut down after the weekend's over. Keep in mind, tonight is Sunday night, even though I'm on vacation tomorrow. Here's a map of all the things that there are to do here in the community of Chafee's Lock. 
One of them is the mill at Chafee's Lock Art Gallery. Before I explore any further though, I came back to my campsite here because I'm going to have some dinner because I'm feeling quite starving. So on the menu tonight, I'm going to have that cucumber that I bought earlier, as well as that sandwich that was nicely given to me by my neighbor, and probably an apple as well, and if I'm still hungry, I've got a couple other things that I can supplement this with. So before this area was known as Chafee's Lock, it used to be known as Chafee's Mill, and that's because the Chafee brothers built a series of mills along here, along the rapids between the two lakes. The first of those mills was built back in 1820, but six years later in 1826, they were all destroyed to make way for the Rideau Canal to come through here. I believe this channel here is where the water would have come from for operating those early mills. This mill building, which is now the art gallery, was built in 1872, many years later. So I still need to brush my teeth and do a couple other things to get ready for bed, but since I figured that nothing too interesting is going to happen for the rest of today, I might as well just sign off for day two of this video. So it was another enjoyable day of paddling out on the water. My total distance today was 29.1 kilometers, so just a little bit further than yesterday. And I guess it brings my total for the two days up to 57 kilometers. Uh, today was kind of dominated by the wind. It was really nice having the wind behind me for the first half of the day. And uh, the wind was, after that, was kind of a little bit more challenging. At times it was really not even a factor at all. Uh, at times in the second half it was also kind of behind me a little bit, but there were also times when it was definitely ahead of me and I was working my way into it. And even worse than that, there were some times when it was coming at me at sort of a 45 degree angle, which believe it or not is actually kind of harder to paddle into than just going straight into the wind because it's kind of hard to you know keep yourself pointed when the, when the wind is sort of pushing your bow you know out of the way. <laughs> So anyways, but you know, and it definitely was stronger today than it was yesterday. And it seemed to be stronger in the afternoon too, when I had it ahead of me. But uh, anyways, like I said, uh, it was still enjoyable. And I, I, I guess I would say I enjoy the challenge of, uh, you know, figuring out the wind and sort of battling it uh, as I went through my day. Uh, I'm really enjoying the scenery so far on the Rito. Uh, in my head, I keep comparing it sort of to what I saw in the Trent Severn waterway last year. And I guess it's not really fair to compare the two because I've only seen a very, you know, kind of small part of the Rito so far, where I've seen a much larger percentage uh, of the Trent already. Uh, but I've really been enjoying this part of it here. Uh, it seems like very natural. Like I really like the sort of the, you know, the rocks and the trees and everything on the lakes. And there are cottages, but not a lot of cottages. There's a lot of areas where you're like, this would be a nice lake for people to have a cottage on. And you'll just see, you know, a huge long side of the lake that just completely natural so I, I kind of appreciate that and I also appreciate that a lot of the cottages that are here are just very old cottages they're built you know the way that cottages were built a hundred years ago they're they're quite small and simple and some of them are kind of falling apart which you know gives it character and uh, I don't know I'm really uh, enjoying my time so far here on the Rito uh, it's also good to see other paddlers who are doing similar things to me and even the boat traffic hasn't been very heavy so far. So um, yeah, I'm definitely enjoying my trip so far um, and uh, looking forward to tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow uh, I'll be paddling hopefully to an island called Colonel By Island, uh, which is not a lock station, but it is operated by Parks Canada. Uh, so I should be able to camp there. It's apparently a pretty common place for people to camp. But anyway, stay tuned for day three of this adventure. And I hope you enjoyed joining me here for day number two. If you watched all the way to the end of this video, I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comment section below, and thanks for watching.